I'm Michael Couture, and this is The Debate, a show where two panelists debate three topics. It's July the 4th. Happy Independence Day to all of our neighbors south of the border. It's an important date in their history, and dates will be an important part of our debates today. A best before date doesn't mean bad after. It's just a, a point of reference for consumers. Time to say bye to best befores. A parliamentary committee recommends scrapping those labels on foods in an effort to reduce food waste. Would you support getting rid of best before dates? Plus, when you make it difficult for people to engage on a particular platform, you give them one more reason to, to leave. Twitter turmoil. Elon Musk introduces view limits as Meta readies to introduce a rival version of the app. Is time ticking on Twitter? And then... Flying into the future. The United States gives the green light to tests of the first fully electric flying car. Are we ready for this next step? Now for two debaters who are always in the driver's seat in Toronto, senior consultant at Enterprise Canada and birthday boy today, Lucas Meyer, and in St. Catharines, Ontario, co-host of One Dish, One Mike, Sean Vanderklis. How are you both doing? Very well, thank you. I'm doing well, thank you. Great to see you both. We'll have you sit tight for just a moment while we get everyone up to speed on our first topic of the show. As Canadians continue to deal with high food prices, a parliamentary committee has one suggestion to make your dollar go further. Get rid of those best before dates on groceries. The House of Commons Agriculture Committee is recommending the feds work with the provinces and territories to look at the impacts of scrapping that labelling because it could be contributing to food waste. As you stroll through the grocery store, you'll likely notice best before dates on everything from canned goods to bottled water. And some shoppers admit it's not clear what to do with an item when you've passed that date. It may still be good or it may be best consumed by, but people will say, no, 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 I don't want to take the risk. Uh, and, and it gets in your head. Best before dates are required on food with a shelf life of 90 days or less. Different from expiry dates, they are really just a suggestion from the manufacturer for optimal taste and freshness. It doesn't mean you have to toss it, but many people do. It means we're wasting more food than we should. The people will throw away food after a product has, has passed, and so that really generates more food waste. And in countries like the UK and Australia, we've seen a reduction of food waste as a result. And that's because those countries got rid of best before dates, but is there an appetite here to do the same? Researchers at Dalhousie University with the Angus Reid Institute found only 27% of Canadians want to ditch best before dates. Best before dates are a relatively new phenomenon. They've come around around the 70s. And um, before that, you know, we were all just using our senses, you know, taste it, smell it. Using that technique could extend the life of some items in your pantry and prevent you from heading back to the grocery store sooner than you need to. And take it from this chef, using your senses makes sense. Anything that smells sour, it's, it's bad. Anything that, uh, you know, if it's fish and it doesn't smell like it's the ocean or if it has a very fishy smell, probably don't eat it. Okay, as always, we start with our opening arguments. There's Sean, there's Lucas. Lucas, we're going to start with you here. Do you think it makes sense to at least explore the, op the, the idea of eliminating these best before dates? Uh, to explore the idea, absolutely. I mean, especially when you live at a time where food waste is actually a major issue in Canada, and on the other side, food insecurity is just as much as a hazard. I mean, we have you know a record number of people who do consider themselves to be food insecure, in, uh, to be food insecure, and that's across the country. That's across all ten provinces, and it's actually an increase on uh, the level of people who consider themselves to be food insecure from 2021. So if there's, an avail there's a possibility to look at a mechanism to reduce both those numbers, I think that's probably a benefit. Sean, what do you think of it? I mean, overall, I think it would be a good idea in scrapping, <laughs> scrapping the best before dates. I, I, growing up as a, as a less economically advanced person, you know, we always ate, we always ate the food right until the expiration date. 
Um, I don't know many people who would follow in that suit. Uh, however, a counter to that would be a simple education process, informing the consumers about what it is they're purchasing and, and what, what the best before date actually represents. I, I think companies are so so focused on, on, um, on profit itself that, that it fails to take in, in, in the advancement of just a simple education process. And it's interesting because that education really is key when you consider that it's a best before date. It's basically optimal date to eat it, not that it has gone bad. Okay, let's take a look at how people have been feeling about this on Twitter all day. That's what we do each day. We post these questions asking you, is it time to toss this best before date? 64.1% say no, it isn't. 35.9% say yes, it is. Interesting when you consider this, Lucas, one other thing that we've noticed in um, some of the, the Twitter discussion here is that somebody actually had uh, tweeted at us saying, look, I don't trust grocery stores in this whole environment of greedflation to actually be honest about keeping good product on the shelves because they will have this incentive to try and keep food there longer than maybe that best before date not pull it off the shelf and still try and sell it to people for a profit. Are you worried about that? I, I think there is definitely, though, to, to bring back something we were talking about before, the whole issue of best before versus expiry and quality versus when you actually shouldn't use a product anymore and how we apply those labels differently. Because obviously for some products, there's, you know, like medication, for example, you shouldn't take it after a particular date, whereas another label might just be, to your point, where it's actually produced or, or the most fresh time for it to be, uh, to be consumed. So I think there has to be mm -hmm. a little bit of consumer kind of education around what an a, a label actually works as. But to the broader point about, uh, about the whole point, look, right now we live at a time where, yes, there's major, uh, obviously there's inflationary concerns, and, that makes, and that's obviously a very legitimate concern. But at the other side, we have 60% of the food that's produced in Canada is wasted. That's about 35 uh, million tons. And so for consumers, avoidable food waste, according to uh, one of the guests that was featured in the opening there, that can increase the cost of food by 10% or more. Uh, and so I think when you look at the types of numbers and the types what was cited before about that this is being tried in other uh, countries to potentially some benefit, I think when you look at the whole scope of the issue, the possibility of reducing the overall amount of food that's wasted in the times of uh, obviously of, of major inflation is a benefit. I mean, we live in a time where people are so strapped and people are so concerned about paying their groceries, yet we're wasting literally tens of millions of tons of food a year. And so mm -hmm. if this is a way to get away from that, I think as, as a, that is a societal good for everyone if we can find, if that can be part of the, uh, of, of, of the element of getting out of this. A societal good, Sean, but are you at all concerned, like some of the people that were tweeting at us saying that they worry that that product will stay on there long before, because, you know, or long after, I should say, because the best before date really is a bit of a fencing that sort of keeps uh, a lot of people honest in, in a sense, and that, you know, you can go to the cash and say, well, look, you know, I'm going to go grab another one because the best before date has already passed. I mean, I think, I think consumers, citizens are, are rightfully have the right to be skeptical about uh, from food manufacturers, from grocers, I, th and I think given the record break of profits that are happening right now in a time of need, in a time of in, uh, food insecurity. Uh, I think those are all fair and warranted criticisms that exist. Um, I would caution, I would, I would like bring up the example of Sobeys as an example. When the best before date, or when it's approaching the best before date, one of the things that they do is they offer that food at a discounted price. I think if we would have developed some sort of legislation or some sort of regulation around that, uh, informing consumers mm -hmm. what their rights are, I, th I think if we were to regulate this, that, that could be the solution, as opposed to putting the hands in, in the, uh, the grocers and the, the, uh, the uh, grocery stores themselves. Yeah, Lucas, before I keep going uh, with you here, let's take a look at some of these stats from that survey, Dalhousie and the Angus Reid Institute. 44% of people had bought a discounted food product um, for which the best before date had passed to, to what Sean was just saying there. 
uh, of uh, consu have consumed food after the best before date had passed. And again, it's not to say that that's, safe, uh, that's unsafe. It's not to say that it's expired. 65% have thrown out food because its best before date had passed. Mm -hmm. When you look at that 65% number, that I think is the one that maybe concerns people because wait a second here, this is, uh, you know, this is food that's going down the tubes that actually could be good for people. And there's actually been some pretty innovative uh, solutions to try to curb that a little bit. There was a story out a couple of years ago about an app where it essentially kind of packages food that might have gone past that date and then sells it at a discount so it doesn't end up uh, in the garbage. So there are, I think, some innovative solutions uh, to look at trying to, to get away from that issue. And I find as well, it's not just about what happens in the stores, what happens at home. I mean, this happens all the time. You open mm -hmm. up your fridge and you see your product and you look at the date, but you use your common sense and you smell or you look at if it, there's a little bit of mold on the bread. I know I've done that before. Like, okay, if there's mold there, I'm going to stay away from it. But if there's a particular product yeah. that has the date, whether it's, you know, again, and that's perhaps, again, educating on myself. Is it best before? Is it when it was packed? Is it an expiry date? And just kind of using your best judgment to do that. So there's actually some innovative ideas to my first point about curbing that issue uh, because you don't want to see food that if the date is not as perhaps as solid or effective as maybe we think it is, you don't want to see food, to your point, go down the drain when it could be consumed or in a time of food insecurity used by others. Yeah, Sean, it's interesting because in my house we have a bit of a rule, uh, when in doubt, throw it out. But yeah. at the same time, you know, if you can cook with it potentially and make sure that you are cooking away some of the potential bacteria. Um, so really, you know, to the point that you were making, it almost seems like education is really the missing piece here. I think so. And I think, I mean, as much as I want the grocers and the food producers to, to take up education on their part, I mean, it's also part of the consumer's responsibility. Like I'm not going to ingest things or put things into my body that, that could potentially affect me. So taking the time as a consumer to educate when are strawberries good, when does bread uh, go bad, where should you put your produce, so on and so forth, right? Uh, this, uh, the, the shelf life of cans, uh, how long water is, is able to be kept stored, so on and so forth. I think there is some onus on, on the consumers to do their research and to do their part as well. Yeah, and something I think we all need to do. Okay, don't forget, this conversation will continue online at CTV The Debate. That is our Twitter handle. We want to make sure that you continue to vote in our Twitter takes. And, of course, we'll come back to those results at the end of the show. Short break for us right now is coming up. Taking on Twitter. Meta prepares an app that is set to take on the Bluebird as the Musk-owned platform has new restrictions set on how much users can view. Is it time for people to flock away from Twitter or can the app continue to soar? That debate is coming up next. Over the weekend, a number of Twitter users were up in a tizzy. If you were trying to keep up to date on the NHL's free agent frenzy, you may have been frozen out at a certain point by Twitter's rate limit exceeded message. The owner Elon Musk claims that it was to prevent extreme levels of data scraping and system manipulation. Observers contend it's a continuation of Musk's pay-to-play model to the platform. And now Meta is launching a competitor for Twitter. Some Twitter users on Saturday were shocked when their feeds just froze, especially when you consider how people use the platform. One user in Kingston, Ontario complained that his area was under a tornado warning, but he couldn't see official Twitter updates on it. In a tweet, Twitter owner Elon Musk said the limits were to prevent so-called extreme levels of data scraping and system manipulation. Tech expert Carmi Levy countered that explanation. We know that's a lie. We know that their cloud services contract with Google was up for renewal at the end of June. We know that Elon Musk is desperately trying to save money uh, by limiting his network exposure. That's one way of doing it. Twitter has now become anti-social media. How do you tell people you can only view a few hundred tweets per day and then you're done for the day? Wait till tomorrow. At the same time, Meta is getting set to launch a Twitter competitor called Threads. It connects to your Instagram account, meaning you can carry over followers. 
don't discount Meta. They've got uh, several billion users between Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. But on the flip side, they haven't had success in trying to create a TikTok clone and a Snapchat uh, clone and a Pinterest clone. Mastodon, Hive Social, PostNet, they've all tried to take on Twitter with varying levels of success. However, with the power of Meta behind it, some believe Threads could be the one to do it. Instagram has 2 billion users compared to around 250 million uh, of Twitter, so it's about 10 times bigger already. So if, if only 1 in 10 Instagram users tries using threads, it's overtaken Twitter in the blink of an eye. As always, we start with our opening arguments. There's Lucas, there's Sean. Sean, we'll start with you. Do you think that Twitter is still tops, though? I mean, as of right now, I think it's fair to say that Twitter is uh, very far ahead of the pack. But, I mean, Meta, Facebook, they're closing in. Mark Zuckerberg is, is, has always wanted to be the main source of, to provide social media to, to all the consumers across the world. And I, I think that they're going to give Elon Musk a um, uh, run for their money. So, Lucas, are you app curious at this point to see and maybe even test drive threads? Uh, I love Twitter. I've been down with Twitter since day one, and this is stupid. Uh, it's the latest in a number <laughs> of really bad moves under the Musk regime. And he's already backtracked it. He at first said that we're going to have this many views for verified users, this many for unverified, and this many for new unverified. And then a few hours later, he says, OK, we're going to increase it to this. And then a few hours after that, he said it's going to increase it to this. The idea that you would restrict uh, viewing in this sort of way, just out of nowhere, out of the blue, is actually quite on brand for Musk. And uh, it, I think the, the one point that was made in the intro is a very appropriate one. The fact that you have, there's been other social media networks that have tried to beat Twitter at its own game, but when you have the size mm -hmm. of Instagram, I think that is the separator from some of these new ones that are kind of upstarts. And it could pose to be quite a threat. I don't know if I'll use it because I'm not big into Instagram. But I, there's that, the numbers don't lie. When you have that many people, it definitely poses a threat, I think. Yeah, and whether or not you can kind of merge all of your sort of meta stuff under one uh, banner and, you know, Facebook and whatnot. Um, well, we continue to use Twitter, and that's how we ask you about these subjects that we debate every day. So let's take a look at this. Is time ticking on Twitter for you? 66.4% Six, of respondents said yes, 33.6% percent said no uh, to the point that Lucas was just making Sean let's take a look at some of those limits that were looking to be imposed that were imposed and now the limits that Elon Musk has said he wants to impose here for Twitter blue users 10,000 tweets per day is your reading limit for unverified accounts that's only 1,000 per day for new unverified accounts that's 500 tweets per day take a look at the app usage though in the United States when you can Consider how big some of these other apps are compared to Twitter. 9.8 hours per week people are on TikTok, YouTube. That gets about five hours per week of viewing. Facebook, 3.8 hours per week. And Twitter, just at 1.1 hours per week. When you consider all that, Sean, do you think that there is a seismic move that could happen here to supplant um, to, to, to Twitter as one of the, 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 the big ones, the town square, so to speak? I, I think that's what Twitter is destined to be. Is, is I think we're seeing the downfall of Twitter right now, unfortunately. I mean, growing up, I was never really a Twitter person. Now that I work in journalism or was working in journalism, Twitter was, was the place I would go to get my information. Not only to hear from credible sources, from verified accounts, but from hearing it from the layman, the layman and the average person who, who has no real subject matter expertise in whatever area that I was covering. The way Elon Musk seems to be taking the the social media account uh, in the direction of what she's taking it is, is just not beneficial as a journalist, as, as a social commentary, uh, and just as an average person. So I'm, I'm excited to see what Mark Zuckerberg, I'm excited to see what Meta, Facebook, and Instagram does. I, I can't wait. Um, I'm just on, on a personal level, I'm counting the down the days. Yeah, Lucas, you know, you were saying you're a big uh, sort of proponent, a big user of Twitter. Is he really, is Musk really sort of going away from the free speech um, sort of framework of it if he is limiting how much people can read? 
Well, obviously, yes. And the whole, the, the, the whole free speech thing, look, he says that he's all about free speech. I still get emails to my Twitter account from accounts that I don't even follow that are of a particular right-wing commentary, let's say. And I get them almost mm. daily. And I don't follow these accounts. I don't subscribe to these accounts. So on one hand, you're saying this is about free speech. But on the other, you sure seem to be promoting a certain kind of speech. And as far as the whole move is about scrapping information, look, this all comes back around to one thing, and that's money. And when you look at all of the changes that Elon has put in and, and the insane run that he's had as CEO from the Twitter blue gong show, the, you know, the startup and then the scale back because of impersonation, to firing content moderators, to firing your media relations staff, to instituting not only the view cap limit, to getting into bizarre Twitter exchanges, to, by the way, the latest, which, shouldn't, which should not be understated, is saying that if you want to use TweetDeck, which a lot of professionals use, that will actually be limited mm -hmm. to people who pay Twitter blue. What is it all like? Led to. It's led to the, a massive decline in ad revenue. Uh, I have my notes here, in fact, if you'll bear with me. Down from April to May, about 59% compared to the same amount of last year, falling short of sales projections. And your valuation from his own mouth has been cut in half. Yes, it certainly sounds like this is really going to turn everything around. So they have a new CEO. <laughs> We'll see what she does. She has a massive mission in front of her. Um, and I, like I said, as somebody who uses Twitter a lot, I have spent a significant time less on it because it's just not the same user experience as it used to be to Sean's point. It just has not been the same since Musk has taken over. Maybe that'll change soon. I certainly hope that it does because I still think it's a usable and important platform. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. just not as fun as it used to be, at least in my opinion. So, Sean, I guess that's the question then, as we sort of show people here what Threads kind of looks like in this wider shot. Um, do you think that the field is now sort of ripe for somebody to come in with so many Twitter users who are maybe a little, uh, you know, a little upset, a little disaffected? And if there is something that is as easy to use as Twitter and maybe Instagram, then is there, uh, you know, is this just really good timing now? I think that's exactly what this is. I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and Meta, Facebook, Instagram have been greeted with a perfect storm that is that is, has been plaguing uh, Twitter since Elon Musk's takeover of it. I think, I think should they they position themselves appropriately and should they develop the proper algorithms required for for people to to jump on and to make that shift. I think I think the sky's the limit for them. Uh, since Elon Musk has taken over, like I mean, I I have actively stopped using Twitter nearly as much as I did. If, if I were to use Twitter under the current guidelines or, or the uh, guidelines that were recently rescinded, I probably wouldn't be using Twitter at all if, if I've been restricted. As a journalist, sometimes threads are like 40, 40 tweets long, right? Mm -hmm. When you get into these threads. So mm -hmm. you, you follow five to 10 stories a day, uh, that 40 tweets long, you, you've well surpassed the 500 count limit. So who knows, but uh, yeah. I, yeah. I think I think Elon Musk is, is is unfortunately doomed Twitter. Yeah, and we'll continue to watch how this happens. But in the meantime, yes, we are still on Twitter at CTV the debate. That's where we want you to go. Vote on this. See if our debaters change your mind at all on how you feel about this. We will be coming back to those results as we always do during our closing arguments. Short break for us now. Though coming up, our flying cars finally coming. Hollywood has been predicting that they'd be here already, but the FAA has now given a special certification to a company that could be ready to take off. We're going to rev up that debate when we return. The days of flying cars may not be as far as the Jetsons led us to believe. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has certified for testing a so-called flying car. Now, it's a combo vehicle aircraft that has vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. So the FAA is ready for it. But are consumers? The 1982 movie Blade Runner was a few years off when predicting flying cars would be here by 2019. But they are a mainstay of futuristic fiction. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. Back to the Future 2 was equally off. 2015 came and went, and cars stayed on terra firma. 
Enter Aleph Aeronautics. The California startup believes people will be looking up at their Model A by the year 2025. The FAA issued the company a special airworthiness certificate allowing for testing on the road and in the sky. It still needs to meet safety standards. At a price of 300 grand for a vehicle that has a flying range of about 175 kilometers, it could be a while before our skies are dotted with hybrid helicopter cars. Now, advancements in technology have been making personal travel more convenient. Self-driving cars were touted as a way of the future, but issues like accident liability and radar interference have prevented them from taking over our roads. Meet George Jetson. So while other fictions got it wrong, there's always the Jetsons, who predicted flying cars would be commonplace by the year 2062. As we start our opening arguments, a little throwback to lunchtime, maybe at my house uh, on a weekday when you go home and watch the Jetsons. Uh, Lucas, let's start with you in this one. Do you think that things are finally starting to speed up enough that we will see flying cars in our lifetime? Well, in our lifetime, if you're going by, it's in my birthday today. I did turn 38, so lifetime in my maybe. I mean, this is insane. Can we just talk about the fact that there's actually been license to actually see? If a flying car, like they're actually going to, this is nuts. And by the way, the fact that you use Back to the Future 2 is a great pick. I was hoping that's the clip that was going to be used because <laughs> when they're going through the rain and Doc Brown is like, it's not exit, Marty. You know, they got to get off. Uh, just so This yeah. is insane. I cannot believe the story when I actually read it. I think we're very, very, very far away from regular normal use. But the fact that we're actually talking about it is, is actually mind-blowing. Sean, are you equally mind blown or do you think that, hey, this could be coming to not a road, but I guess a road because some of these are basically hybrid cars. So do you think that we could eventually see it soon? I, I, I grew up, I'm very similar in age to my, to my counterparts. I grew up idolizing Back to the Future there. So the fact that you did use that piece uh, makes, me, makes me so happy. That being said, yeah, I, I grew up thinking that, hey, there's going to be a time when I can drive a flying car. And 2015 would have put me a couple of years removed from when I first got my uh, my uh, license there. But also would have made me perfect time to, to have a flying car in and of itself. Uh, I don't believe that we are going to see a regular use where everyday people are going to have flying cars uh, at their disposable. But I, I think very mm -hmm. much like my counterpart that, that, that it's exciting times to be alive, that, that flying cars are a possibility, that research is being done, that the human mind, that society is exploring, right? It's very, very reminiscent of the 1950s, 1960s, the space age exploration where it, it's okay to dream, it's okay to believe, and, and that's what I'm doing right now, so... Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm curious to see what people on Twitter thought about this. I was reading some of the comments, but I really want to see how people feel about this. Um, are we ready for flying cars? Overwhelmingly, 69.1% of people say, no, we're not ready for them. 30.9% said, yes, we are. Uh, Lucas, I'm going to come to you with this because, and I say some of the comments in this were uh -huh. basically, we can't handle normal roads. How would we handle flying cars? Are you of that sort of feeling that, you know what, there's too many accidents on the road, what are we going to do when it's 30 feet up? Or on the flip side, Mike, you could say, you know, even with flying cars, we're still going to have crazy traffic jams and congestion, especially uh, here in Toronto and some other cities. Look, we're obviously not ready for flying cars. I mean, let's just, like, no one's actually contemplated the fact that we're actually going to have just regular driving cars. But I will say this is that if you look, this is actually serious, if you look at the way that technology has evolved from just 1900 to 2000, and all of the technical advances, and you look from where we started within 100 years, like it is actually mind-blowing when you look at subways, you look at sky trains, you look at obviously helicopters, other aircraft, submarines. It's actually quite insane when you take a step back and you look at it. Now, this is going to a whole new stratosphere. This is real sci-fi, high-tech sort of stuff. 
Uh, but the idea that you could have, I mean, it really, it's just a massive expanded drone usage in a way. Um, we're f and just looking at some of those graphics is it's, it's absolutely wild. So, uh, you know, while we're, we're very, very far away from this being used, uh, you know, in, in any sort of normal way, um, the fact that it actually does kind of make some sense that we've reached the point where we can actually start testing this technology, um, mm -hmm. even if we're if we're very very far away from it being a kind of an everyday mode. It is quite ex it's it's scary, but it's also kind of exhilarating. <laughs> so I, I don't want to challenge Lucas's idea there, Sean, that we are very, very far away from it. When he speaks about how rapidly we sort of ramped up in that last century from 1900 to 2000, is there any reason to believe, that, or do you have any reason to believe, that we couldn't, within the next, let's say, 20 to 30 years, really get to that part or get to that place where we do have cars that are in the air? I mean, I would make the argument that I, I think we are a lot farther along than the public realizes. I think that the companies have been probably doing work on the side, um, have, have invested probably millions of dollars in, into this research. I'm not sure what the qualifications to get the FCC, FCA uh, certification or, or approval, but I would imagine that they're, they're, they have to be pretty far along in that process. I think our biggest hurdle is probably selling public safety or uh, demonstrating that public safety is the number one concern to the general public as well as to, to the regulators themselves. Um, but I, th I think it's definitely realistic, given that it's 2025, the way technology works, the way innovation works, that we, we can definitely see in probably in 20, 25, 30 years that, that, uh, that not every household, but some households will have a flying car. That's insane. I think that's yeah, it, way. It, I think that's way too soon, guys. I think twenty-five to thirty is way too soon. But to the point about public safety, I think that's a really, really good one. I mean, yeah. distracted driving is bad enough. Can you imagine distracted flying? Can you imagine somebody on the four hundred and one yeah. just weaving through traffic on their phone and then just put that thirty feet in the air with another person <laughs> going through like an a, an airborne side post? It'd be wild. I, I would imagine. I would yeah, imagine. It, it, going to take it is is uh, self-flying cars that, that we're going to remove all possibilities from the user very much like tesla at least i mean that's what i would do but i know mm -hmm. nothing about science nor do i know anything about cars <laughs> Yeah, Lucas, I know you think that it's crazy, but I mean, I, I think back in the year 2000, wouldn't mm -hmm. you have even thought that this would be crazy, that I'd be holding an electric notepad with a camera on the back of it in my, in my hands while hosting, you know, a show? I mean, forget about the me hosting a show. In the, in the year 2000, I would have never thought that either. But I mean the technology part. I mean the technology part of, you know, this, even HD, when we went to HD TV, everyone thought, oh my God, this is crazy. And now mm -hmm. when you consider where phones are, where portable technology is, I mean, hey, this, this might be going soon, no? No, in all seriousness, Mike, it is a very, very uh, understandable point. The fact that we're at a point where we can actually test this sort of technology. And if you actually look at that prototype, that flying car prototype, like uh, it, it, it looks obviously incredible and it's, uh, how the, the it looks i'm sure the value is insane i think you mentioned something like three hundred thousand dollars there's obviously a lot of work to be done but no it, it really does speak to just how advanced this technology is and the leaps and bounds that engineering has made in this in this area it, it is in all seriousness like it's it's actually incredibly impressive uh however i'm i'm anxious to see just how far we get in that kind of 25 to your, to, you know, that 25 to 30 span. I would love when in my mm. in retirement to be just hopping in my car, going <laughs> up in the air, and just cruising to Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and chilling at home. You know, it'd be fantastic. I don't know if yeah. it's going to happen, but it'd be a lot of fun. Shout out Antigonish. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we're going <laughs> to leave that one right there. We will, of course, come back to it during our closing arguments. And, of course, we have our hot take coming up after this one, and we hope that you can stomach it. We'll be back in just a second. Get to those closing arguments in just a second. First, though, an American tradition like none other. Joey Chestnut! Champion eater Joey Chestnut came out on top once again in the annual Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest. There were brief concerns the event was going to be scrapped due to lightning 
fortunately or unfortunately, when you talk about, we were talking about food waste earlier. Anyways, for those who might be squeamish to watch, the eaters did truck on. Chestnut downed 62 dogs in 10 minutes. That's 13 shy of the all-time record, which of course does belong to Joey Chestnut. All right, let's bring back Lucas and Sean. Um, Lucas, I don't know, is, is this something you do on your birthday? What do you think? Well, actually, this is quite appropriate because not only is it my birthday today, I'm also a dual citizen. Uh, so I'm also an American citizen and <laughs> a Canadian citizen, so maybe I will celebrate with a hot dog. But I will not be partaking in this much. I think you asked in the email, like, how much could we do in 10 minutes? I actually spend a disproportionate right. amount of time on this earlier today to really think about what I could do. I think if I really, really, really pushed myself... I, mean, I think I could do seven pretty easy. Not easy, but I think I could get to seven and feel good about it. If I really okay. push myself, I think I could do ten. I think I could do a hot dog a minute if I really did not care about my stomach the next day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sean. Can you beat that, Sean? And, and do you have the technique? That's the question. Uh, first, look, I definitely have the technique. Yeah, gr growing up, growing up in Niagara, growing up poor in Niagara, hot dogs were a mainstay at our house. I love hot dogs. I go to Costco, <laughs> get hot dogs, go to baseball games. Yeah, hot dogs. I was very excited to see this. I firmly believe that I could put up a solid 20, 25 hot dogs. Whoa! <laughs> firmly believe. Wow. Like, I, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm first place in this contest, but I'm definitely top 10. Right. And did you see Chestnut wow. walk in today? He walked in like a WWE wrestler, like with the crowd chanting yeah. his name. It was a wonderful spectacle. American yeah. its finest. Yeah, a spectacle indeed. Now I feel like if I have you guys on again, we, we're going to have one segment that will just be an eating contest, but I don't know if people will tune in or not. Um, <laughs> okay, best before dates, because talking about food wastage, that was our first debate. Let's take a look at how those closing arguments went and how people felt about it um, and where that went. Is it time to toss the best before dates? 64.6% 4, 64 of people, I should say, say no. It is not time to toss the best before dates 35.4 percent say yes it is lucas your closing argument on this uh this is an idea to explore the potential benefits of removing these dates i don't think anything there can be no harm done in just exploring this at a time again of unprecedented mm -hmm. food insecurity and food waste uh, anything we can do to try to reduce those problems i think is a mission worthwhile but sean you think education is one of the the pillars of this as well I, I think so, very much like uh, like Lucas said. This is an idea to explore the possibility, possibilities of food insecurity that we're facing. This is an unprecedented, unprecedented crisis in that uh, is happening here in Canada. And if that's not the case, if that is not the solution, then, food, then education is. Then the ownership and the onus should be on the consumer themselves to, to take uh, to take appropriate steps to inform themselves on on on, on uh, best before dates. However, I do agree that best before dates should be uh, should, should have expired, if you will. Yeah, and is Twitter beyond its best before date? That's what we talked about in that second segment. Is it time? Um, is time ticking on Twitter? 65.7% of you say yes, it is. 34.3% say no, it isn't. Um, Sean, when you consider everything that is coming and sort of converging at this moment with Meta looking with their own app, do you think that Twitter might be on the way, or might be going the way of the dodo? I very much agree that that is the case. Unfortunately, that is the circumstance. Uh, Elon Musk has unfortunately been not the best for Twitter, ha has, has decreased uh, its user friendliness, has, has implemented rules and restrictions, has taken away uh, the verification from numerous accounts to a point where it's now problematic uh, for, for the users themselves. One of the things that we're, we're being told right now is that Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg may compete in a UFC match or an MMA match. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if this actually happens, given that Mark Zuckerberg is now going to make a run for, for uh, capturing the audiences on, the, on that, that platform. Lucas, Lucas, if you can keep it quick, then we've got to get to our third subject. Uh, Twitter is still a giant. Uh, despite Elon, not because of Elon, it now faces a real challenge uh, with threads. We'll see what happens, especially as he leaves as CEO, uh, because his reign has been tumultuous, to say the least. So we'll see what happens. But the, the latest steps are, are not good, in my opinion, for Twitter. 
And in our last subject, it was all about flying cars. Are we ready for flying cars? 69.2% of you say no, 308 say yes. Um, and Lucas, you say not in your lifetime. Well, it depends. I th again, we might actually see it in my lifetime to the extent of how usable it is is what remains to be seen. But do I think I'm going to see somebody flying a car within my lifetime? Yes, I think I will see that. Last word to you, Sean. 25 years, I'm saving up. But 25 years to save $300,000, I think I can do it. Wish me luck. Uh, Lucas, if you see <laughs> me, uh, just I'll wave down to you. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Or, or he'll give you a lift for your birthday all the way to Antigonish. There you go. Uh, okay, Lucas Meyer, the birthday, the birthday boy today. Thank you so much for being there. Sean Vanderclis, appreciate you being there as well. That does it for the debate.